besides just being a super talented musician, Buddy Holly influenced music history in ways that I think a lot of people don't really understand. And since Nashville, where I live, is currently being dumped on by more snow than I've seen in years, it felt fitting to talk about Buddy Holly today. This is going to be a super long one. Despite Buddy only having like a few year long career, there's so much to talk about. So grab your coffees and let's get into this. A very small percentage of people who watch my videos are actually subscribed, so if you enjoy music history, if you like hearing stories from music history, consider subscribing. I post a few videos a month and a bunch of shorts. It's free, and if you end up not enjoying it, it's really easy to unsubscribe. Charles Hardin Holly was born in Lubbock, Texas on September 7th, 1936. And no, that isn't a typo in the last name of that graphic. We'll get to that. Buddy's father, Lawrence, who went by L.O., was from Texas, but kind of like the other side of Texas. He was working as a line cook when he met Ella Drake, who was descended from the famous explorer Sir Francis Drake. They married a year later and moved to Lubbock. Buddy was the youngest child. He had two older brothers named Larry and Travis and one older sister named Patricia. Buddy was named after his two grandparents, and since that name was kind of long and a little bit annoying, his mom just started calling him Buddy, which was a pretty common nickname for the youngest child in a family. And it stuck, and he was Buddy forever after. Buddy's parents were somewhat older when they had him, and they kind of thought that they were done having children, so Buddy came as a bit of a surprise to them. And, at least according to his brother Larry, that played a part in Buddy always being doted on by his parents. Larry claimed that Buddy always got special treatment, and even when he was an adult, was kind of seen as like the baby of the family. But that could have just been Larry talking as the youngest child in my family. I know that sometimes older brothers aren't all that accurate. Larry and Travis, his two older brothers, loved playing music. It was a very musical family, and they would play in talent shows around the Lubbock and West Texas area. Because Buddy always wanted to do whatever Larry was doing, he wanted to play with them. So his parents bought him a little toy violin, and he joined Larry and Travis on stage at a talent show, despite the fact that he had no idea how to play the violin. Maybe a little bit worried about being upstaged by Buddy, or maybe knowing that Buddy didn't know how to play and might ruin the show, Larry greased up the violin so no one could actually hear Buddy, but the judges were still so impressed with the song that he sang that the group won the talent show. Buddy also loved listening to music, specifically Hank Williams, like everyone else in the South at that time. Later on, he would get into more of that R&B sound, and that's kind of where rock comes from. It's merging country and R&B. Both of his brothers had military service during World War II. Larry went to the Marines, and there he picked up a guitar and started to learn how to play it. But he also saw an elementary school classmate playing a guitar on the bus and became kind of obsessed with it, and he wanted one exactly like Larry had. So his parents went to a pawn shop and bought him his first acoustic guitar. And his two older brothers then taught him how to play it. In elementary school in 1949, Buddy met Bob Montgomery. Bob was also really interested in the guitar, and the two became pretty good friends, almost being like brothers, since Bob was an only child and Buddy's two older brothers were significantly older than him. Bob's parents ran the Gin Cafe, which was named after, I think, like a cotton press and not the liquor, but the two would play together all the time. And then when he was 13, Buddy met Jack Neal, who was one of his other earliest partners. Jack was an older teenager, I think he was like 17, and he worked as a carpenter's assistant for... L.O., Buddy's dad. Jack said, quote, At lunchtime, I'd get my guitar out of the car and sit and play out in the sun. One day, Mr. L.O. Holly saw me and said, My boy Buddy plays guitar too. You all ought to get together. End quote. Which they did, and they started appearing as Buddy and Jack in local talent shows. Later on in high school, Buddy learned that his vision was so bad that he was technically legally blind and he needed glasses, which was devastating. I had to get glasses in high school in like 2009, and I hated the social stigma around that, and it was much worse in the 1950s. Because he was tall and thin and kind of gangly looking with his big glasses, he got somewhat of an image in high school. A classmate said, quote, he was what today we'd call a nerd. I don't think any of us took him seriously in those days, end quote. But one person did. Her name was Echo McGuire. Echo came from a pretty wealthy and very religious family. She was a different 
kind of Christian than Buddy, and the two sex didn't really get along all that well. Echo started hanging out with Buddy and Bob Montgomery, and the trio became really good friends. Buddy asked her out in their sophomore year, and in typical Buddy Holly fashion, fell head over heels in love with her almost immediately. In 1953, Buddy wrote an autobiography as an assignment in his English class, and in that he said, quote, Well, that's my life to the present date, and though it may seem awful and full of calamities, I'd sure be in bad shape without it. End quote. In that essay, he also talked about his love of leatherworking and his interest in music and kind of hinted at the idea that he'd like to pursue music full time, but he was still trying to find like a regular job and was failing at that. Also in 1953, Pappy Dave Stone started KDAV, which he claims, and no one has disputed him, that it was the first all-country music radio station. Before that, a few radio stations would broadcast like an hour-long country music show like the Grand Ole Opry or the Louisiana Hayride but no one had just played country music from start to finish. Pappy recruited a couple of the top DJs in the Lubbock area named High Pockets Duncan and Ben Hall, and they became the new DJs at KDAV. Buddy very quickly found a home at KDAV and loved it there. Buddy and Jack got themselves a regular spot on a very popular Sunday show. Eventually, they invited in Bob Montgomery and a few of their other high school friends. That's when they became known as the Rhythm Playboys. And it's also when Buddy started to get a little bit more attention at school. People thought he was this kind of like a radio star, like Hank Williams, but they still didn't know just exactly what he would become. Eventually, Jack Neal left the group and they started going by Buddy and Bob and playing around the local area. Outside of just their radio show, they would play at some bars, which they definitely weren't old enough to get into. They were kind of rougher bars. There was a story that Buddy and Bob would be playing, and then a fight would break out, and they would switch to, like, a slower number to try and, like, cool things off a little bit. But High Pockets Duncan, one of the DJs at KDAV, was kind of frustrated with how often Buddy and Bob would get swindled out of money for shows. So he became their manager, and in somewhat of a rarity for early rock and roll managers, he seemed to completely have their best interest at heart. He even stated in their contract that if they started getting famous outside of the Lubbock area, he would forfeit all managerial claims on them. High Pockets ended up opening his own bar in Lubbock, and it was a favorite spot for Buddy and Bob to play. So they were going along playing their kind of like country music, and then everything changed in 1955 when Elvis came to town. Elvis had started playing this new kind of music that was mixing his country background with the R&B that he fell in love with in Memphis. And we can't really escape the racial component of this because it was the South in the 1950s. Elvis was singing in a way that made him sound like he was black, but he wasn't so that made white audiences feel comfortable listening to him. Elvis ended up coming to Lubbock and playing shows that KDAV would put on, and because of his connection with KDAV, Buddy got to meet Elvis and be in attendance for those shows, and it just changed his life. After that, they stopped playing country and bluegrass and basically just started playing like Elvis. Sonny Curtis, who was a guitarist from Meadow, Texas, and a newer addition to the Rhythm Playboys, said, quote, The day after Elvis left town, we turned into Elvis clones and we were booking out as an Elvis band, end quote. But something that R&B groups and this new rock music groups were doing that country didn't do was have a drummer in the band. So if they wanted to be like Elvis, they needed a drummer. And Buddy knew just the guy. Though he was three years younger than them, Jerry Ivan Allison was a really good student, so much so that he was only a grade below Buddy. And he was a pretty decent drummer, so he was brought into the group. And then 1955 was the year that rock exploded. Blackboard Jungle was released, which introduced the world to Bill Haley in the song Rock Around the Clock. And teenagers would, like, get up and dance in the aisles during the show. It was a music for teenagers that was blurring that racial divide that had always existed in their lives. In concerts through the South that were regularly segregated, it was allowing these two different races to love the same kind of music and just, like, get together and celebrate music together. The kids loved it. The parents hated it. The religious establishment largely hated it, which probably made the kids love it even more. Elvis was everywhere. New artists like Little Richard and Chuck Berry and Ike and Tina Turner were making huge waves. Bill Haley was really popular, for better or worse, and Buddy wanted to be a part. But first, he needed to graduate high school, which he did in 1955. But that was kind of a bittersweet day, because Echo, who he was still dating at the time, because of her incredible grades, had won a spot at a pretty prestigious Christian university that was 100 miles away. They planned on getting married right after high school, like leaving the graduation ceremony and going to the courthouse to get married, but that didn't work out. They decided to still try and stay together, but long distance in those days is very tough. 
Around this time, Buddy was kind of feeling a little bit restless. He was struggling to make inroads with his music career and also trying to find a job to just like sustain his life during this time. He started working for his brother Larry, laying tiles and just kind of doing manual labor stuff. J.I. or Jerry remembers at this time that often they would be hanging out and Buddy would just get up, hop in his car and start driving. And maybe this is some revisionist history, but he had this kind of feeling that Buddy knew he was running out of time and he couldn't just sit around. He needed to go do stuff. In October of 1955, Buddy's group opened for Bill Haley and the Comets. Eddie Crandall, who was a manager from Nashville, was at that show and he saw something in Buddy and knew he could be a star. There's a story that he actually called up Colonel Tom Parker, who was Elvis's new manager, and suggested that the the colonel, the colonel, take on Buddy as well, but he was too busy, so the colonel told Eddie, why don't you just take a stab at it? And Eddie was like, all right, sure. But Eddie wanted just Buddy, not Bob. And in another surprising thing for early rock and roll, Bob Montgomery was super gracious and just stepping aside and letting Buddy take this stab at his dream. So Buddy got his first big break. I was lost in a fool's paradise. Because of its association with country music that was really popular in like the 30s, 40s, Nashville was seen as Music City, but Memphis was taking a run at that. Memphis had people like Johnny Cash and Elvis who were spearheading this new rebel rock sound, and Nashville was kind of afraid of that and wanted to fight back. So they went out and signed a whole bunch of young kids who they thought could play rock and roll, just kind of throwing anything at the wall and seeing what stuck. That's how Buddy Holly signed a record deal with Decca Records and a publishing deal with Cedarwood. He signed his first contract with Decca in February of 1956. On that contract, Decca misspelled his last name, so he forever became Buddy Holly without the E. Buddy had a few recording sessions in Nashville, but Decca really didn't know what to do with him. By this time, Buddy had recorded on his own independently quite a bit, and he had a good understanding of what he wanted to do and what he wanted to sound like. These music bigwigs in Nashville didn't love that, and they also had an idea of exactly what made a hit record and wanted Buddy to just fit into that mold. They didn't let Buddy use his own band, they didn't let him play guitar while he sang, and it came out just kind of sounding awkward. For the second session, they did let him play rhythm guitar while he sang, and they let Jerry play drums for it because... It was summer break and Jerry was actually available because he was still in school at the time. Almost as like an afterthought appended to the end of the session, they also recorded a song that Buddy and Jerry wrote together. A few weeks before that recording session, they saw a movie called The Searchers, which was kind of like a dark and gritty John Wayne western. John Wayne's catchphrase in that movie was, that'll be the day. And that was a catchphrase that Jerry, Buddy, and their group of friends very eagerly adopted. J.I., who was Jerry, I alternate between the two, I'm sorry, said, quote, A little while after we saw the movie, we were over at my house. Buddy had a tune in his head and say, hey, why don't we write a song? I said, that'll be the day. He said, hey, that's a good idea. End quote. So in that second session with Decca, they recorded That'll Be The Day. For all of these recording sessions, Buddy was continually butting up against the Decca A&R man which is not something you did in those days. It was largely seen that like the A&R guy was the label and he controlled your future in the music industry. When Buddy's Decca releases all flopped, they very quickly dropped him. He got the letter in January of 1957 terminating his Decca contract. Paul Cohen, who was the Decca A&R guy, told Buddy that he just didn't have the voice to sell pop records. And then to someone else, he said about Buddy, quote, he's the biggest no talent I ever worked with. End quote. So was that it for Buddy? Was that all he was destined for? A few mediocre recording sessions with Decca in Nashville and a little bit of local fame in the Lubbock bar scene? Somehow that just didn't seem like the future that he envisioned for himself. You don't know what you've been a missing, oh boy. Oh boy. When you're with me. Norman Petty spent most of his life in Clovis, New Mexico. He had always loved music and he was super fascinated by the technical aspect of it, by the recording and the new engineering instruments that were becoming available. In 1948, after leaving the Air Force, he married Violet, his high school sweetheart. And they moved back to Clovis. I think they were in Dallas for a bit. He moved back to Clovis and got a house right next to his parents, and they owned, like, this mechanic shop and gas station. Norman and Violet, with a guitarist named Jack Vaughn, started the Norman Petty Trio. They had one minor hit with RCA, but never really got national attention and spent most of their time just kind of touring around military bases and playing for them. 
which was a pretty good gig, but it was not like going to get you famous or be all that interesting creatively. But since Norman was always more interested in the technical and the recording side, in 1954, he built his own studio. He would let a lot of local bands come and record, and where other studios made you pay by the hour, he let you pay a flat fee so you didn't have to try and rush the creative process. But that wasn't all out of the goodness of his heart. It was widely understood that if a song that Norman helped you record and then promoted through his musical contacts became successful, Norman would get a large percentage of the profits. And he made sure that any hit song that came out of his studio was released through his publishing group called Norvajack. People got kind of a strange feeling around Norman, and it's safe to say that Larry, Buddy's brother, didn't like him at all. He said, quote, During World War II, when I was in the military, I remember falling asleep one night in a foxhole. When I woke up, there was this giant snail crawling right across my face. Well, I tell you, I used to get just the same kind of feeling when I was around Norman Petty, end quote. Buddy had known about the Clovis studio since like 1954, when one of the Rhythm Playboys suggested that they record there. And then a local artist who had recorded in the Clovis studio that Buddy knew about was getting a little bit of success from that recording, so Buddy, after his DECA deal collapsed, decided to give it a try. So Buddy, Jerry, a guitarist named Nicky Sullivan, and a bassist named Larry Wellborn drove the one-hour drive from... Lubbock to Clovis. Larry Wellborn had played bass for Buddy and Bob back in the KDAV days. So when Don Guest left the group and they were looking for a new bassist, Buddy went right to him. Larry wasn't always available because he was still playing in another group at that time. Nicky Sullivan was recently back from a stint in the Navy and he went to a jam session at his friend Jerry Allison's house where he met Buddy. Nicky never really considered himself all that talented as a guitarist, so he was pretty surprised when Buddy invited him into the group without really even an audition. One of the first songs that this group recorded was That'll Be The Day, but doing it the way that Buddy always envisioned it, with him playing the lead guitar. I think Norman recognized their talent right away, and he let them use the studio for free and would let them stay in his house and just kind of gave them all of these concessions. He even promised to send the single to New York and kind of promote it around his circle of friends that he had there. But in return for all of that, he said he needed to be listed as a co-writer for That'll Be The Day. And the other song that they recorded called I'm Looking For Someone To Love. Nikki Sullivan said, quote, he said that people in the music industry knew him because of his trio, so people would be more likely to take an interest if they saw the name Norman Petty instead of just some unknown kid from West Texas. But he didn't care. He was just delighted to think that the songs were going to be published and that someone like Norman believed in him and was going to push him in New York. End quote. But there was a little bit of a problem. Buddy had already recorded That'll Be The Day for DECA, and part of his DECA contract said that he was not allowed to record and release songs that he had already recorded for DECA for like a period of five years. But Norman knew that That'll Be The Day was going to be the strongest song they recorded, so he wanted to get it out right away kind of capitalize on this rock and roll trend that was happening. So he thought that if they came up with a band name and released the song under that, Paul Cohen and Decca might never realize that Buddy Holly was the singer of it. I mean, why would they? Buddy didn't leave that big of an impression. Buddy had always loved the R&B group The Spiders, so Buddy, Jerry, and Nikki Sullivan sat down one day at Jerry's house just kind of looked through the encyclopedia for any other bug names that might fit. They almost called themselves the Beatles, but Jerry vetoed that. He said he didn't want to name their band after something that people would generally just step on. So they settled on the crickets, liking the, like, sound connotation of it, and people immediately hated it. Nikki said, quote, Everyone kept telling us what a dumb thing we decided to call ourselves. It was kind of embarrassing, even for the people who had to introduce us on shows. End quote. Norman pitched the song around to his friends in New York, the music industry people he knew, and after a lot of rejection, it found a home at Brunswick, which was a subsidiary label of Decca Records. While all of that was happening, Larry Wellborn couldn't make a gig, so Buddy asked a guy named Joe Malden to step in. Compared to Larry, Joe wasn't really all that good of a bassist, but he owned his own bass, where Larry was still borrowing his from high school. And in those days... That's all you needed to be brought into the Crickets. So Buddy asked Joe to replace Larry permanently. So the Crickets, minus Larry, plus Joe, sat down to sign a contract with Brunswick. I know it was boring to talk about like contracts and stuff, but this next part becomes important a little bit later on, so pay attention. So that first contract between Brunswick and the Crickets was only signed by Joe, who was a little bit confused why he was signing a contract for a record he had nothing to do with, Nikki Sullivan, and Jerry Allison. This is my... Cat Ajax, everyone say hi. They kept Buddy's name off the contract to still try and like hide him from 
that breach of contract issue. But because Buddy wasn't on that contract, it freed him up to sign a different one. When the label heads kind of realized how good Buddy was as a vocalist, they decided to sign him as a solo artist to Coral, which was another DECA subsidiary. It's like a step above Brunswick in the pyramid of labels or whatever. In those days, rock and roll was very churn and burn. You would find someone who sounded pretty good and could play this rock music, churn out a few records, see if anything stuck, see if anything become a hit, and probably by the next year, they would be gone. It's like these labels all were just trying to achieve a one-hit wonder, and that would be a success for them. So with these two contracts, these DECA sister labels had two bites at the apple. They could release a record by the Crickets, and people who liked more band stuff would buy that, and then they could simultaneously release just a buddy solo record, and people who liked solo singers would buy that. So it just gave them two shots to get a hit. While they were waiting for their record to be released, Buddy was still dating Echo, and Jerry started dating a girl named Peggy Sue Guerin. Buddy had written a song called Cindy Lou that kind of had more of like a Latin feel, and they had played it in their live show quite a few times. When they went to Clovis to record it, J.I. was warming up by doing this little like paradiddle thing, and Buddy loved it, and he said he should play that for the recording. But then once they did that, the whole kind of vibe of the song changed, and the name Cindy Lou didn't fit with it anymore. So Buddy put in Peggy Sue's name instead, and that's how a rock legend was born. The summer of 1957 was pretty rough for Buddy. That'll Be The Day had been released through Brunswick, but it wasn't doing well. It didn't hit the top 100, it was struggling, and Buddy was feeling a little bit let down by all of it. He was also missing Echo quite a bit while she was still at school. And during this time, he started an affair with a woman named June Clark. June and her husband James were big supporters of the Crickets, often letting them stay in their house. June was not happy at all in her marriage, but only stayed because they had a son together. She said she was drawn to Buddy because of his charm and kindness. She said, quote, I knew he liked me because he was a normal young guy, but the thing he always wanted to do most when we were together was just talk to me, end quote. Also around that time, tensions were starting to grow in the band a little bit. Buddy and J.I. were like, best friends and joe would always just kind of go along with whatever the majority wanted and this left nikki feeling kind of ostracized and alone also with buddy playing lead guitar nikki felt that he kind of wasn't really even needed and wasn't being creatively fulfilled the other guys would also kind of like playfully tease him a lot which started to wear on him plus he also had feelings for june clark that summer of 1957 also brings up one of the conspiracies of buddy's life in his biography of buddy holly philip norman claims that there's a long-standing rumor around lubbock that Buddy Holly got a girl that he was kind of casually dating pregnant. It was a girl that he didn't like all that much, so he wasn't willing to ruin his burgeoning rock career to marry her and settle down and raise a kid. So his parents talked to her parents and they came up with an agreement. Her parents sent her to some kind of like rural place to have the baby and then gave it up for adoption. And Buddy didn't have to be involved at all. Nikki Sullivan claims that he was there when this girl broke the news to Buddy and saw how Buddy reacted very negatively to that. He also claims he was there later on tour when they were passing through that place that the girl had been sent, and he said Buddy got out of the car, she met him at this like fence, they talked for a bit, he got back in the car, they drove away, never brought it up. But Philip tracked down the girl that everyone said this was about, and she was married and she had two daughters, and she said that she never really even knew Buddy all that well, and it wasn't true at all. Plus, Buddy's constant confidant was his brother Larry, and Larry said that he had never heard of any of this. That could have just been Larry trying to protect his younger brother, but I don't know, it doesn't really seem like Larry to do that. But still, people that Philip talked to who would know about it swore that it was true. So, maybe may true, maybe not, I don't know, but somewhere out there, there may be a man who doesn't know that he's Buddy Holly's son. By the end of 1957, That'll Be The Day had started to pick up speed. It was a very slow burn, but by November, it had hit number one in the charts, and it made Buddy and the Crickets a household name in rock. They spent some time in New York working on recording for their next records, and June Clark came to visit them. Buddy begged her to leave her husband and run away with him, but she was unwilling to do that. She said, quote, It went on for about an hour, him begging, me saying no I couldn't, in the end there was nothing else to do. I took my son back to Lubbock and I never saw Buddy or spoke to him again. Then they embarked on their first ever long tour, which was a grueling three months, and when they arrived back to Lubbock in December, Nicky Sullivan announced that he was leaving the group. He was only a member for about 90 very unhappy days. He was constantly at odds with Buddy and Jerry, creatively unfulfilled, and just exhausted from long days on the road and recording. Leaving Buddy was something of a trend 
around this time in 1957. At school, Echo had fallen in love with another student from Missouri. When she came home for Christmas in 1957, she told Buddy that it was over between them. She eventually married him and they both became teachers. Larry is convinced that Buddy never got over Echo and Echo's mom is convinced that every song that Buddy wrote was about Echo. You're gonna say you love me cause I'm gonna love you too. The start of 1958 saw them touring just as heavily. The song Peggy Sue, which was released as a buddy solo under Coral, had hit number three. Before August of 1958, they amassed seven top 40 singles. Everything was going exactly how Buddy foresaw it going, and then things got a little bit better. Whenever they were in New York recording or whatever, they stopped in on the president of Pure Southern Music, who was pretty instrumental in getting them their first deal with Brunswick. In June of 1958, in the reception area of Pure Southern Music, Buddy saw Maria Elena Santiago. She was born in Puerto Rico. Her mother died when she was pretty young, and her father was a detective. Her father sent her to New York City to live with her aunt. Her aunt ran Pure Southern Music's Latin division and was frequently traveling out of the country for that job. So Maria Elena kind of got this role as a receptionist assistant for her aunt. Buddy fell in love with her immediately, which is a very stereotypical Buddy thing to do. When they first met her, they went out for lunch, and at that lunch, he asked her out on a date for dinner that night, and at that date, <laughs> dinner that night, he proposed. She thought he was just kind of joking, and she said, okay, but you gotta come ask my aunt first, thinking he would never do that. But nine o'clock the next morning, he was at her apartment asking her aunt for permission to marry her. At this time, Jerry had gotten engaged to Peggy Sue, so Larry thinks Buddy was just kind of desperate to find someone. Larry said, quote, He was just looking to get married, anyway, anyhow. Jerry was about to do it, and Buddy didn't want to be left behind, and I knew he'd been real heartsick since it all ended with Echo. But most people were still pretty happy for Buddy, all except Norman Petty. Maybe he could sense the trouble that Maria Elena would bring into his life. Buddy had already started to get fed up with Norman. Norman didn't understand the rock world, and he didn't understand the importance of publicity and PR. This whole idea that singers needed to have an image and, like, have nice clothes and drive the right cars and look a certain way and present themselves a certain way just didn't make any sense to him. So Buddy felt that... His career was being harmed by Norman not getting him publicity opportunities. Plus, all of Buddy and the Cricket's money was paid directly to Norman, and Norman said he was depositing it in a bank in Clovis. So anytime Buddy or the Crickets needed anything, they would have to go through Norman, who would send them the money. Buddy, encouraged by Maria Elena, started to think that Norman was not paying them the royalties that they deserved. Maria Elena said, quote, Buddy had always trusted Norman and believed in his judgment, but when he got to New York and started talking to people there, he realized how backward Norman was, end quote. Buddy kind of hatched this plan to get married at the same exact time as Jerry and Peggy Sue. He wanted them to have this, like, combined wedding ceremony. But Jerry got tired of waiting, and him and Peggy Sue eloped in July of 1958. Buddy wasted no time and got married on August 15th. By the fall of 1958, Buddy was struggling to get another hit, which wasn't really uncommon for rock and roll stars, who, barring a few standouts, were mostly just like flashes in the pan. It didn't help that rock and roll in general was in a tough spot. Elvis went to war. Little Richard, after seeing like a Russian telescope or something in Australia, thought it was a sign from God and had given up rock music for gospel. The payola scandal was starting to kick off, so things were just not really looking good for the genre of music that Buddy established himself in. Instead of getting down about that, Buddy shifted his focus and started his own publishing group called Prism. He wanted to focus on being a talent scout and building up the artists in the West Texas area that he felt were largely ignored. Buddy always wanted Lubbock to be his home base, but he ended up moving in with Maria Elena in Greenwich Village in New York City. By October of 1958, Buddy knew the direction he wanted to take his career, and it was away from Norman Petty, and he wanted to take the other crickets with him. So when they were in New York, Buddy convinced Jerry and Joe to also drop Norman, and they were going to go confront Norman when they all got back to Clovis. But Buddy had to drive from New York, and Jerry and Joe flew, so they got there several days ahead of him and just kind of decided to go to Clovis on their own for some reason. While they were there, they let it slip to Norman Petty, who was starting to pick up on some bad vibrations, that Buddy and they were leaving him. Norman managed to convince Jerry and Joe to stay. He said that they just wouldn't fit in in New York and that Buddy would eventually drop them anyway. So when Buddy got there, he was pretty mad about that and he kind of had this big argument with Norman that got pretty heated. They fought about money, they fought about Norman stealing the crickets, they fought about everything, and it ended with Norman allegedly shouting at Buddy, you'll die before you see any of the royalties. 
which is something that he vehemently denied, but Larry, who was there, said it happened. Regardless, Buddy was now a solo artist, with no access to all of the royalties that he was due for his time with Norman. So, Buddy and Maria Elena were basically broke, surviving off of loans and charity from Maria Elena's aunt. Around this time, Buddy didn't want a tour. He wanted to focus on recording, and he wanted to focus on Prism and building up other talent, but he felt he needed to because he needed money. He needed to provide for his family. He had started a legal process against Norman. He got lawyers involved, and he kind of expected it to be wrapped up pretty soon, but he accepted a tour in January of 1959 to just kind of get some funds going in the meantime. It was a short tour, just going to a few different Midwestern cities. Buddy and Maria Elena, probably out of pride, because he's this rock and roll star, didn't want to let anyone know that they were struggling financially. So when they went back to Lubbock for Christmas, they brought a ton of presents. That ended up being the last time that Buddy saw Lubbock, Texas, and his family. It was also the last time he saw his old partner, Jack Neal. Jack later said that that last conversation he had with Buddy was all about Buddy's hope for the future. Buddy really wanted to come back to Lubbock to build a label to give back to the city and invest in the talent there. Norman kept the crickets going by bringing in a new singer, which was something that Buddy's lawyers did not like all that much. They said that Buddy had just as much, if not more, right to the crickets name than Norman or Joe or Jerry, so they wanted to bar Norman from using it. That's when Norman brought out that first ever contract that they signed with Brunswick, the one that did not have Buddy's name on it. It was a long drawn out legal battle that did not end until after Buddy's death if you can say it ended at all, really. So it's January of 1959, and Buddy, desperately needing money, is set to go out on tour. A tour that Maria Elena has a strong feeling he shouldn't do. But Buddy says he has to. He says he has to make this money. He's tired of surviving off of loans. The winter dance party began on January 23rd in Milwaukee, the first of 24 dates. Since he didn't have his crickets, Buddy created an all-new backing band. He brought in Tommy Alsup, who had kind of sort of replaced Nicky Sullivan in the crickets on guitar, a guy named Carl Bunch on drums, and he brought in a new young singer that he was mentoring, a guy he found in West Texas and was trying to just like teach the music industry to, named Waylon Jennings to play bass. Waylon had no idea how to play bass, but somehow figured it out. Since the other artists on the tour, Richie Valens, the Big Bopper, didn't have a backing band, those three guys were the backing band for the whole tour. Except for Dion and the Belmonts, who were also on the tour, I think they had their own thing going. The tour was rough. It wasn't like the modern tours you think of today when you think of rock and roll stars. In order to cut costs, they hired a discount bus service, and eight different buses broke down, which would leave them stranded in below freezing weather in the middle of snowstorms. The only bus that they could find that actually worked was an old school bus. So it had like metal seats, but it mercifully had a heater that worked. They would often play a show, drive through the night in their little school bus in freezing weather with not good food, not good sleeping conditions, and then arrive at a city early in the morning, play a show that night, drive again. It was also not a well-scheduled tour, and they ended up like doubling back on themselves several times, driving through the same mountains and snow that they had just passed the day before. It was so cold one night when their bus broke down that Carl Bunch, the drummer, got frostbite and had to drop out of the tour. On January 31st, they played in Duluth, Minnesota, and a young teenager by the name of Robert Zimmerman came out to see them. He would soon move to the same neighborhood that Buddy lived in with Maria Elena, Greenwich Village, change his name to Bob Dylan, and go on to be one of the biggest musical stars in history. But he never forgot just how good Buddy was when he saw him play live on that last tour. On February 2nd, the tour played the Surf Ballroom in Clear Lake, Iowa. The next show was 365 miles away in Moorhead, Minnesota. After that show, they were supposed to turn around and immediately drive 325 miles back to Iowa. That sounded exhausting to Buddy and probably everyone in the world. I don't know why they would do that especially considering that he was going to be in a bus full of people getting increasingly more sick. I think the Big Bopper had, like, the flu so bad that it was turning into tuberculosis or something. So Buddy wanted to get to Moorhead a little bit early so he could just rest, be in the warmth, and do some laundry. He also really needed to call Maria Elena to figure out what was going on with his legal battle with Norman Petty. I mean, he needed some money. So he chartered a plane that would take him from... Iowa to Fargo, North Dakota, which was a much easier drive to get to Moorhead. I could do a whole video on what happened next, so I'll try and 
briefly cover it as best as I can here. In order to split the cost, Buddy offered to let people fly with him. Besides the pilot, the chartered plane could seat three other people. So naturally, Buddy and his two remaining band members, Waylon Jennings and Tommy Alsop, were supposed to be on the flight. But the Big Bopper, who was pretty sick at the time, used just like his intimidating personality to convince Waylon Jennings to give up his spot. So then it became Buddy, Tommy Alsop, and the Big Bopper. But Richie Valens also wanted the seat, and he kept arguing with Tommy Alsop, telling him, like, please give me the seat. Tommy flat out refused. Until after the show, when they were literally getting in the car to drive to the airport. Richie begged Tommy one last time, and for whatever reason, Tommy still doesn't know why he said this. He said, why don't we flip for it? So they pulled out a coin, Richie won the flip, Richie got the plane seat. So Tommy got in the bus, Richie got in the car, and... Buddy Holly, Richie Valens, and the Big Bopper drove to a little airport in Mason City, Iowa. Most of that tiny airport's business came from a guy by the name of Hubert Dwyer, who owned a charter plane company out of that airport. Someone from the surf ballroom called to charter a plane for Buddy, and Dwyer missed that call. He was at some sort of event, I can't remember. So his employee, Roger Peterson, picked up and accepted the chartered flight. Throughout the night leading up to when they were supposed to take off, Roger Peterson repeatedly checked in with the control tower, to check in on the weather and stuff. The weather, although not great, wasn't bad enough to ground any flights or cause any problems for an experienced pilot. There was a blizzard coming in, but it was supposed to arrive after they landed in Fargo, which meant that Roger couldn't then fly straight back home, but it shouldn't be an issue for the flight. Roger was a pretty decent pilot, at least Dwyer really trusted him. He had been flying since he was 17 and had just recently achieved kind of that last level of being qualified to be a flight instructor. He had logged 710 flying hours, and he was very familiar with the plane that they would be flying in. It was a pretty older plane, but it had recently had a major overhaul and it had only logged like 40 flying miles since then. That plane was specifically bought for Roger to fly, and he had racked up something like 130 hours on it. So the three rock stars got to the airport, apparently they were super nice, which Dwyer didn't expect, and... Dwyer and Roger got them loaded into the plane and ready to go. Buddy took the seat next to the pilot, the big bopper was behind the pilot, and Richie Valens was like diagonal to the pilot. Around 12.55 in the morning, the plane took off, and no one is quite sure what happened next. From the observation deck, Dwyer watched the plane take off and then perform a perfect 180 degree turn heading northwest to Fargo. Dwyer then watched the taillight until it disappeared in a patch of fog, but he quickly picked it up again after that. But he said when he picked the taillight up again, it didn't look like it was climbing. It looked like it was drifting downward. He chalked that up to an optical illusion and went home. But he couldn't sleep. Something was kind of just gnawing at him about that flight. He called the control tower at the Mason City Airport, and no one had heard from Roger Peterson. He also called a few different airports around the area, and none of their control centers had heard from him either. By 4.10 in the morning, he had no choice but to call the flight lost. By 8 a.m., Dwyer was back in his office, but he couldn't just sit still, so he got in his own plane and decided to trace the route back to Fargo and see if he could find what happened to the plane. Almost immediately after he took off, he saw the wreckage. It was about five miles to the northwest, meaning it crashed roughly five minutes after takeoff. The plane crashed in a snow-covered field going full speed. There were no survivors. Of course, conspiracy theories abound about what actually happened in the cockpit. Some people think that the Big Bopper tried to, like, change seats and he got up, which either, like, knocked Roger Peterson or upended the weight distribution or something, but that's kind of absurd considering how small those planes were. No one was moving. But he always carried a small pistol with him in his bag, and some people think that it either accidentally or on purpose went off killing Roger Peterson and crashing the plane. That theory gained ground after the pistol was discovered with a bullet missing. But later, the guy who found the pistol admitted to firing one of the bullets just to kind of check to see if it still worked. It doesn't really make sense for that pistol to go off accidentally. It's out of character for Buddy to have pulled it out and been, like, showing it off. And I don't know why anyone would ever shoot their pilot right after takeoff for no reason. None of the guys on the plane did drugs and Buddy didn't even drink because of, like, a long-standing ulcer issue that he had. What most likely happened is pilot error. Although Roger Peterson was a pretty decent pilot, he was bad at all of the ways that mattered for this flight. He was partially deaf in his right ear, kind of throwing off his sense of balance. He was really good at flying in clear skies, but flying at night or with low visibility, he was notoriously bad. He was rated as below average at his ability to fly by instruments only, which is crucial for a pilot to be able to do when you're flying at night or when you're flying through like a storm or fog cover. During times where visibility switched from clear to suddenly bad, 
he had a tendency to kind of like freak out and panic about that. And he would let the plane slip out of his control. And he repeatedly suffered from vertigo while flying. His license indicated that he did not meet night flying requirements. So it's possible that Roger was taken off guard by the cloud that Dwyer saw them fly into. He was a big rock and roll fan. He knew Buddy Holly. He probably knew the Big Bopper. So he was probably excited and talking to these rock stars in his plane. And then when he hit that cloud cover and suddenly lost visibility, he panicked a bit. This plane he was flying had an indicator that was really easy to misread. It was the altitude indicator, and it was something called a Sperry gyroscope, which was inverted. So the nose angle registered as climbing when it was descending and vice versa. So it's possible when he hit that cloud cover, suddenly lost visibility, he looked at that altitude indicator and misread it. So that would explain why they hit the ground at full speed, because he thought he was ascending the whole time. No one really knows for sure, but that's kind of the theory that makes the most sense to me. He, Roger Peterson had also worked a whole day leading up to that. The rest times for pilots weren't nearly as strict as they are now. After the crash, the plane was said to have had no failure and was operating perfectly, so it just makes the most sense that it was just a really unfortunate accident and a pilot error. After the crash, the rest of the tour learned of the deaths when they got to Moorhead. Tommy Alsop was the first in the door at the venue, so he was the first to learn about it, and he broke the news to the rest of the tour. But the winter dance party wasn't about to lose out on money, so they brought in a new singer and carried on with the tour. Over the next few days, Buddy's family and friends learned about the crash. On that day, Bob Montgomery was driving home to Lubbock with his wife, and he said he just had the strangest feeling, and he kept telling his wife to be careful because he felt like something was going to go wrong. So when he got home, he called Echo McGuire and heard from her about what had happened to Buddy. Maria Elena watched the reports about what happened to her husband on the news. The next day, she suffered a miscarriage. She would eventually remarry, and then she moved to Dallas, where she still continues to fight for Buddy's legacy. The Crickets carried on without him for a while. They even played with Waylon Jennings in the 80s, but they never had the same success again. The legend says that J.I. and Joe called Buddy on the night of his death to apologize and make amends and try and work together again but Buddy never got that call. On February 6, 2016, the Crickets played a farewell show at the Surf Ballroom in Clear Lake, Iowa, the last place that Buddy ever performed. Jerry Allison stayed married to Peggy Sue through most of the 60s before divorcing. Peggy Sue ended up passing away in 2018, and Jerry passed away from cancer in 2022 at the age of 82. After he left the Crickets, Nicky Sullivan tried his hand at making music. He released a solo record but couldn't really get anything going, so he retired from music in the 60s and ended up working at Sony until he passed away from a heart attack in 2004. Joe Malden continued to work with the Crickets until he passed away from cancer in 2015. Buddy left behind a trove of unreleased records that Norman continued to put out and arguably exploit for years to come. He bought a movie theater and turned it into a radio station, but he passed away from leukemia in 1984. That old studio where Buddy first recorded a lot of his records is now like a really cool museum that you can go tour through. Buddy's legacy was immense. When he played in England and they broadcasted a few of his performances, it influenced basically all of the British invasion. People like John Lennon and Paul McCartney absolutely loved Buddy Holly, and they came up with the name The Beatles because it sounded like The Crickets. He had a short career, but it was so powerful. And that's the story of Buddy Holly. If you liked the video, give it a like, share it with a friend if you think they would like it, and thanks for sticking it out through this super long one.